All right, today on Beers TV, we have the top 20 fails or mistakes related to feeding your fish and fish food. Yep. If you have uh, lost a fish in the past, maybe broke out with uh, illness in the past, a lot of these things are actually related to nutrition and keeping our pets healthy. So you're gonna learn all kinds of different things, our tips and tricks today, and understanding what actually goes into feeding your fish uh, through all of the mistakes that we've made in the past, <laughs> so you guys don't have to make them. All right, so number one's actually been a revelation for me and changed the way that I think about this in the last few years. Yeah, that's uh, making the mistake that we can do better, or missing that we can do better in nutritionally for our fish. Uh, these things are pets. They're man made to last like upwards of decades in some cases, and we can do better for them so they can last that long haul. I think the underlying problem here is actually most of the fish food manufacturers out there have produced these fish foods uh, for like impulse buys like a goldfish, right? Yeah, some Where flakes. cheap is the like most important component of the whole thing. However, the entire pet industry has actually evolved that conversation in the last couple of decades. The uh, reef tank end of it is lagging a little bit behind, <laughs> but we're like catching up now. Yep. And so most of these pets we're gonna have for a decade plus, mm -hmm. I've named them, I've invested thousands of dollars into an ecosphere for them. They're part of my family and I can do better. I want them to be healthy. I want them to live long lives and I wanna know that I'm doing the right thing for them. All right, so number two, how would you even know if you were doing this wrong? And that is the heart of the mistake of missing the signs of malnourishment. You know, a lot of times it goes beyond like a pinched belly or anything, or like they're just not an e-feeding response. Coloration can change, you know, they can, their behavior can change. They can even just disappear in the tank. Yeah, so a lot of these fish get their coloration pigments from the foods that they're eating. Right. So if they're starting to look pale, uh, maybe missing from uh, their, their diet. If they're getting sick frequently, not it's true. likely that they're not getting the nutrition uh, that they're, they need. But most importantly is that last one. Yeah. If they mysteriously poof uh, and they're gone or they're dying, that is the biggest sign of malnutrition possible. And so if you've had fish just mysteriously poof in your tank, uh, most of them just don't up and die. So uh, mm. if you're not at least considering the fact that maybe I'm not taking the right approach to feeding them, I think we're missing a huge, huge opportunity. And number three, if you don't know, you don't know. Yeah, that's true. The mistake is assuming that all fish foods are the same. I mean, you go browse, even our website, there's just tons of different fish foods on there. Uh, and some might think that this is the same as this is the same as this is the same as that. And actually, you know, there is some differences specifically when it comes to protein and fat content. Vitamins, palatability, yep. size, energy content. So there's a lot of things you're gonna learn throughout today's video, uh, like what to look mm -hmm. for specific to your fish but they're not all the same. And once you start to understand what the different fish need, you can actually find the right tool for the right job and use it the right way. All right, so number four, how could anybody look at any of these and know definitively that one of them is better than another? Yeah, so the mistake here is missing what does matter in your fish food. And you know, we start to take that evolutionary step and making the long haul, the longevity of our fish. And that starts with looking at what's inside the fish foods. They're all not created equal, but we're talking fat, protein, vitamins, and minerals. Those are the three things really that matter at the top level. Mm. So fat is energy. So if you got fish that are swimming around all day long, burning energy, we obviously need to replace it or they're just gonna waste mm, away. Right. So you can uh, choose to do that through frequency and feeding more often. You can do it by quantity, being feeding more at a single time, or you can also do it by feeding more nutrient dense foods. Foods that have higher fat quantity or mm -hmm. co uh, content means that I don't have to feed as much which also means less pollution of the tank from all of the other things yep. that are in that food. So that's probably the route that most people like to go after nowadays is a nutrient dense food with less waste and pollution of the tank. But the number one thing, probably more important than all the rest, is just a little bit of common sense in reading what's in the actual food itself. Yeah, example here, these PE pellets. I can look at the first three ingredients and I've got mysis, debone whitefish meal, and Antarctic krill meal. Uh, not only that, but the crude protein and fat content, 42% protein, 8% fat, high fat, high protein. Yeah, so I've read many of the uh, foods and they'll start off with uh, potato starch yeah. and uh, corn meal and uh, all kinds of things like that. And what that actually represents, if that's the number one or two ingredient in there, 
That is actually representative of the fact that they're looking for the cheapest possible way to provide carbohydrates and energy into the food. Right. Right. I don't know about you, but I'm not after the cheapest possible way to do this, especially when the difference is often like five bucks a month. Yeah. Right. I, I'm looking for a better solution, one that'll keep my fish and pets healthy and alive. So almost all the dry goods will have some kind of binder in them, the dry food. So they'll have, uh, you won't be surprised to see some amount of wheat mm -hmm. or uh, like brewer's yeast or different things in them, but they should be way, way, way down the list of uh, ingredients. So the TDO Chroma Boost here is fish meal, uh, krill meal, squid meal, fish oil. And, and then, you know, you see the fish oil is actually one in there. That's fat, right? <laughs> and so I'm not surprised to see that the crude protein on this is 49%, right? 49%, half of it is actually protein. And crude fat here is uh, 14%. So this is one of the highest uh, mixes of this. this is probably why the breeders use this oh, yeah. type of food. For sure. uh, people that actually like grow fish uh, from babies on up as a, for a living use foods that are going to do that more efficiently. Mm. <laughs> uh, so this is the type of thing. Make sure to pay attention to it. And also, if you want to avoid like the brewer's yeast and all that stuff entirely, that's where frozen foods come in because you can actually get the organism without all of the filler. All right, so number five, there isn't a one-size-fits-all answer to this very important question. Yeah, the mistake is not considering the frequency of feeding for your fish. There's a, a diverse of a group of fish. You know, I've got perching fish. I've got, you know, big giant fish. I've got little tiny fish that are all over the place all the time. And each of them have a very specific dietary need, and we have to be considerate of it. I guess if I could say the biggest mistake here mm. is that when you go to the forums and you go ask people, how often should I feed my fish? I get answers like, well, once a day, twice, twice a day, mm. three times a week. One uh, size fits knows? all. Yeah. yeah, one size. Nobody's asking, what do you have in the tank? Yeah. Right? Because these fish uh, require totally different approaches. Now, if you have like larger predator fish that are used to capturing like a large amount of prey all at once and then surviving off of that for a day or two, totally, totally different mechanism than something like an anthea that is plucking away yeah. at, at uh, plankton all day long, eating tiny little foods constantly throughout the day. We have to think about what the fish's natural diet, at least if we want them to survive and be healthy, we have to make a more intelligent approach. And it isn't that hard because most of these fish, we already know like what they eat in the wild. It isn't a giant leap. Mm -hmm. And so if we ask the question rather than how often should I feed my fish, how often should I feed my hawkfish? How often should I feed my antheas? These types of questions will actually hone in on better results. And specifically, I'm gonna hone my like really harp on the anthea thing here yeah. because this is one of those fish that a lot of people just kind of shrug their shoulders. And chromis that are really, really active. They just disappear over time. Mm -hmm. Not true, right? A big portion of this thing is actively looking at their nutritional needs and then not only doing it for ourselves, but giving advice to the people that ask all of us like think nutrition, think energy, think protein, think vitamins and minerals, because these fish just don't die. There's a reason, and nutrition is probably one of them. Number six, one of my favorites I've struggled with. <laughs> a lot of people like these types of fish, but you need to think about it. Yeah, this is one fish that we didn't talk about in that last group, and there's a special considerations, or a mistake is not making special considerations for sand sifting fish. They thrive on what's living in the sand or, or even foods that you put in there, and we have to be considerate of that if you want this fish. Yeah, so a lot of people add sand fish sifters just to like try to keep the sand bed clean. And uh, when it's really dirty, they actually find a lot of food in there. Right. And it's not necessarily the dirty uh, in there, but like, you know, when the sand has a lot of nutrients in it, it tends to grow a lot of microfauna in there, and that's what it's actually sifting out. So sand sifting fish, you need like an intelligent approach to this. Now there's always some people that roll the dice and just get lucky, but you don't wanna be one of those people. Mm. You wanna be one of the people that think about the nutritional needs of this fish and supply it and have really, really high success rates. So in this case, I probably wouldn't add a sand sifting fish to a tank that doesn't have a lot of sand that hasn't been established for a year or more. Right. And there'll always be those anomalies where somebody says, no, 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 I did it successfully. No, I'm talking high percentage success rates where we care for the animals properly. Also, if you're going to do it so sooner, there are methods. So mm. for in my instance, what I would do is take like reef chili and I would take uh, the frozen cyclopods and rotifers. Come on, Kalanis too. Kalanis, yep. yep. And I put them into a, a little like feeding uh, bottle with a straw on the end 
and I'd spray it right in the sand in front of him. And it didn't take but like maybe a month before he figured out that this is a food source and that he should follow a little straw around, <laughs> right? So this is a way to bridge the gap, but you have to be willing to actually do it. Yeah. So think about the nutritional needs. This fish is actively sifting through the sand, and even if it's willing to jump up and grab a, a mysis out of the, uh, out of the uh, water, doesn't mean that it's actually nutritionally correct for us. So with my experience uh, with signal gobies, is they eventually would go after myasis out of just sheer like desperation. They would desperately mouth at trying to eat this large shrimp that is nowhere near the microfauna, that is digestive tract, an entire metabolic system is designed around. Mm. So think about what it's trying to eat, which is tiny, tiny, tiny little microfauna, and don't be feeding it large mysis shrimp. All right, so number seven, maybe one of the most valuable things that you'll hear today. Yeah, and this, um, the mistake is missing the value in frozen foods. So you may hear us talk about, you know, nutrient dense foods and all of these types of like pellet foods, and we point to pellet foods for it, but there is value in frozen foods, uh, specifically when it comes to that nutrient density, and I can self-regulate almost because uh, it's not as nutrient dense, so there's less to break down in the tank, perfect for new reefers. There's actually a whole slew of things yeah. about frozen foods that actually make them, uh, in many cases, a better option. Okay, so first one is uh, most of them don't have wheat germ mm -hmm. and corn flour and potato starch and stuff in it them. It looks like a mice shrimp. It is a shrimp. Right? <laughs> Sometimes they've uh, like, uh, put in a vitamin mineral premix with it as mm -hmm. well, but, or gut loaded it or yeah. different things. But it's also generally more palatable by the fish. It's a soft organism that's fleshy, very similar to a lot of their natural diets. They'll be more willing to eat more of it. Also, it doesn't deteriorate as fast in the tank. So mm -hmm. the pellet will actually break up yeah. and disintegrate fairly quickly in the tank. Whereas the, the little shrimps tend to float around and be found by crabs and snails and uh, other organisms that are actually eating it uh, more actively rather than rapidly polluting the tank. But that big thing is the thing that you just mentioned, which is if I'm a newer reefer, if I have a nutrient dust food like pellets, I'm walking by four times a day, throwing yeah. it in because I don't know any better. Yep. It looks really fun to feed them. That's how feeding is like one of the main ways we engage with our pets, right? Yep. Okay, it's just way easy to take a nutrient dense food and overfeed it. Because in a frozen food, most of what you're feeding is actually water, right. right? The water content of that food is really high. So when I drop it in there, I'll see all the shrimp dissipate or any of the other foods. But also, one of the other things you get with frozen foods is variety. So oh, yeah. there's like foods like Rod's Foods or mm -hmm. the do-it-yourself uh, like reef chili frozen mix that we've done before where you can get like the squid, the shrimp, the krill, the mysis, uh, like your own, they can even mix in pellets, but you can do all kinds of things. Mix it in there, you can chop up fish eggs, all kinds of different things, mix it in there, make your own type of fish food, or use something from like rods, it's already done that all for you, mm -hmm. and feed a variety of fish and natural diet to your fish. All right, number eight is actually the inverse of that equation, which is increasing the nutrient <laughs> density for that more experienced reefer who already has a healthy feeding pattern that matches the filtration, but wants to up the game for the health of their fish. Yeah, so don't miss the value of things like food soaks, where you can take a less nutrient dense food, like we just said, with frozen food, but you can actually increase its nutrient density. You can even target very specific needs of fish in proteins, in fat content. Uh, also works in dry pellets. Dry pellets, probably the best actually in yeah. this case. So with a dry pellet, this dry nature means that it actually sucks up these nutrients mm. and soaks uh, pretty well. Uh, and for the most part, doesn't release them into the tank as long as it's uh, ap uh, rapidly eaten. So yep. a lot of that nutrient density is actually getting into uh, the digestive tract in a really easy, already broken down uh, form mm. that provides all that energy. So if we have uh, something like an uh, anthea that's consuming a lot of energy and burning through a lot of fat, I can actually take an already high fat content food and increase that by adding some of something like Cellcon, which will soak up all that excess fat and provide additional energy to that fish. But also for a fish that we generally get that are starting small and they grow big pretty rapidly, yeah. they have high protein uh, uh, requirements. So what we can do is actually take things like the uh, KZ amino acid concentrate for fish, soak that up in our uh, dry food as well, 
In this case, we're taking already broken down amino acids that are building blocks of protein and making it easier for the fish to grow and provide for that nutritional need as well. However, there's even one more step on this. Yep. Maybe you have fish like angelfish uh, and Brightwell's uh, angel uh, elixir here will actually provide amino acids more similar to their natural diet and provide fish and their absolute diets for all of these different things. Think about the fish and think about how you can improve what you're already doing. All right, so number nine is actually, again, the inverse of that, which is... Yeah, and this is uh, making the mistake that we've all made of feeding too much, specifically when we first get in the hobby. I mean, I love to see my fish react to the food that I'm putting in the tank, and most times I walk by, they actually do. They actually come to the tank and wait for me because they know that's a feeding response. Uh, but we can get wrapped up in that and overfeed our tanks. So there's a lot of debates uh, out there if you ask how much is too much. And I'm gonna tell you, they make a test kit to tell you that you're feeding too much. Yeah. It's called a phosphate test kit, and there's also one called a nitrate <laughs> test kit. So if whatever you're feeding perpetually raises the nitrate and raises the phosphate and it just gets higher and higher every single time you test, that means you're feeding too much. Mm -hmm. If you find that uh, your tank has a stable nitrate and phosphate input uh, and it's being consumed by the corals and fish that are in there, well, that's Just probably right. the right amount. Yeah. Uh, if you're seeing it dwindle because the coral and fish are soaking it all up and you're at zero, zero, you're probably not feeding enough. So there's actually test kits to tell you how much mm. you feed. It's called a nitrate test kit and a phosphate checker because the checker is actually way easier to read. Okay, so number 10, I've heard what you had to say, <laughs> but now I'm lost because I actually need to feed that much. My nitrate and phosphate levels are skyrocketing. Yeah but you've just told me that the ansias need to be fed multiple times a day, what am I supposed to do? Yeah, that, the mistake here is uh, not having your filtration tied to your input. So your filtration is not good enough and you need to take some extra consideration into how you're filtering. Whether you add more filtration, whether you filter longer, maybe you adjust some things, but your input has to match the output or vice versa, output has to match the input. So what I just said before is scale down your food. So if you can't scale down your yeah. food and nitrate and phosphate are going up, you have to just adjust the output. Now that can be as cheap as a couple of filter socks and then just changing them out every three days, which is the optimal thing that we found from yep. uh, our BRS TV investigates. Yeah. So all that export from just changing out your filter socks and cleaning them. But if you don't want the manual methods, some protein skimmers, are absolutely two, three, or even four times better than another one. So I can export two, three, four times as much of that food. Or if I just take the time to take the one that I already have and maintenance it a little bit better, I can probably double its production. Mm. Just take some effort into understanding how to tune it. We actually have a, a five minute guide on tuning your skimmer. You should watch it if you want to look at that because it's probably the cheapest way to increase the export. But then there's things like refugiums and yeah. algae scrubbers, uh, all kinds of different things out there that can match your nutrient to export to match the input as well. Number 11, this question's been asked 10 million times, about 3,000 times a day. We're gonna answer it in its totality right now. I am guilty of this one, and the mistake here is rinsing your frozen food, the amount of effort and time. I, I remember every week or every month I'd make a new batch of food, go in, fishnet, rinse, 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 and then put it all back and freeze it all together, uh, only to find out recently, I'm just wasting my time. Yeah, there is very, very, very little nutrient actually in the water uh, after that. I'm not gonna say there's zero value, right? but all that time that you put into rinsing it, change out your filter socks instead and it will be way, way, way better, more efficient use <laughs> your time. So uh, there is, and, and in all actuality, as long as you have corals, all of the fats and uh, aminos and proteins and stuff that's kind of in that suspension water is probably good for the corals as well. Yeah. Won't really contribute to phosphate and nitrate unless you're using just the absolute worst food known to man. So don't use that one. <laughs> uh, but outside of that, I would not recommend wasting time. There's just a better place to put your uh, time and effort that will produce a better result than thawing and rinsing all of your frozen food. All right, so number 12, some of you do this correctly, some of you haven't even thought about it all, but most of us could do a little better. Yeah, the mistake here is not feeding your herbivorous fish correctly. And, you know, I have tanks in, my, in all of my tanks, and they eat pellet food, they eat frozen mysis, they eat all of these types of meaty materials, but 
you know, if I'm not considering that they are herbivorous fish, they do need plant food in their diets, uh, then I'm making a big mistake. If you've ever been snorkeling and watched a yellow tang and what it does all day long, it eats algae all day long. It's not an active predator hunting yeah. down other fish. And so this just kind of goes back to that you know, theme of there isn't a one size fits all answer to this. If we're going to approach it better, we need to think about it better. Think about what this organism has grown up over a millennia to eat. And if we feed it that, it will probably have a healthier mm. uh, existence in our tank. And because it doesn't break out with sickness means it won't give other sickness to other fish in the tank. It's just overall better to think about this entirely. So there's options like nori here that people clip on and it'll have a little bit more natural behavior where it's pecking at the yeah, glass. Yeah, takes some extra it. effort, yeah. Uh, some people will rubber band a little bit of nori mm -hmm. to a rock to give that kind of effort as well. But there's also options like the seaweed extreme. You know, I think it says right on the top here, 67% seaweed in this pellet. Mm. So most of this is actually making sure that it's just incorporated into its diet. So whatever way is convenient for you, up your game and find ways to incorporate seaweed and natural uh, uh, types of vegetative material in your herbivorous fish diet and they'll survive and do better in your tank. Number 13, when you see the words expert only fish, it generally means diet. Yeah, so the mistake is assuming that picky eaters and expert only fish are just a luck of the draw on their diet and getting them to eat other foods. Yeah, when you actually go ask this question of, uh, can I keep this fish mm. or that fish? And you'll see 20 people raise their hand and say that I did, I did fine. Yeah. You'll see 20 people say that it, uh, I didn't have success with it. But there's actually 300 people out there raising, not unwilling to raise their hand that they killed their pet. Yeah. Uh, but the difference there may just seem like luck of the draw. I just got one that was lucky that eats this type of thing. Mm. And that is true to a very, very small portion of the cases. But most of the successful people out there have actually take expert only types of approaches to understanding what that fish's diet is and solving it. I think Chad's uh, fish to the uh, tile fish was actually mm. one of the best. Yeah, he had these uh, orange spotted file fish and what he, they're used to picking at, you know, corals and they're picking at things off the rocks. And so what he did to do is just take some frozen food spread it over a coral skeleton, refreeze it, and then put it in the tank because that is their natural uh, you know, behavior for eating. Same thing with like copper band butterflies and those that take the, all the measures to build these elaborate feeding type you know, rings and pipes that only the butterfly fish can get to more matches their natural behavior. Yeah, like that tile fish, the thing there is is important is you may not have to do this forever. So in the case of Chad and on this tile fish, he smeared all that mysis, froze it on. He did that probably for months, mm. but eventually he got a taste for mysis and yep. he captured the ones that were floating off. And now it's learned a different behavior and it's actually going to eat those, uh, 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 that frozen food that comes off and you don't have to freeze it anymore. But it was an expert only approach that mm. went to this expert only fish. I, I'll take my own uh, signal gobies. Yep. You know, it's an inexpensive fish, so it may not seem expert, but they have a really, really high mortality rate. If you take uh, the approach that we talked about, which is taking some of the egg, uh, like the fish eggs, like these uh, uh, super eggs. Uh, these are also really great for antheas, by mm -hmm. the way, super high energy content. But getting those, the Kalanis, the Rotifers, and then spraying it in the sand right in front of them, tiny, tiny little, uh, like closer to the crustaceans that they'd eat or microfauna, and they're able to get that nutrition in and digest it. Before you know it, they're actually following that thing around. So in this case, until that uh, sand bed is totally robust, I probably actually need to commit to the fact that I'm gonna feed the sand. I'm also gonna have the filtration that backs up this extra food that I'm spraying into the sand. Yeah. And feed this, per this fish in an expert-only manner. So when you read those words, do your research on what that expert only means. It probably means something to the diet, and then figure out if you're willing to do the extra effort. Number 14. Probably one of the most valuable things you could buy, especially if you're doing uh, pellet foods, but a lot of people don't have one. Yeah, the, don't miss the value of a feeding ring. So there can be magnet, they can be suction cup. I would recommend the magnet version because suction cups just tend to fall off. But you know, you're not having a lot of that food float on the surface and down your overflow. Sometimes air gets trapped on those pellets and it keeps it on the surface rather than sinking down. A feeding ring can help you keep it in the tank for the fish. When you say sometimes, I would say Almost all the time. All the time. <laughs> hey, watch your pellets, you sprinkle them in, then 
<laughs> right down the overflow. Yep. It's like a highway right down uh, <laughs> to get stuck in your filter sock, degrade and pollute the tank. All right, what I actually wanted to do is feed the fish, not the filter sock. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so I like those filter ring, or feeding rings as well. Sometimes if you can get the, like the little plastic or acrylic tubes that actually go below the water an mm. inch or so, yeah. uh, that allows for it to really take some waves as well and make sure it falls. You'll see the fish actually huddle around it waiting for the little bits to come out. Yeah. So uh, really think about, like they're probably anywhere from five bucks or 15 bucks or the best ones. Get a feeding ring, especially for feeding uh, pellets, it will actually decrease the amount of pollution in the tank and increase the amount of nutrition that go to your fish. Number 15, I see a lot of people who want to do this, they ask all the time, mm. don't do it. Yeah, don't make the mistake of mixing food and food size particles in your auto feeder. So I've got these which are fairly large pellet and then I've got these which are really tiny, but I'm feeding them both at the, uh, to my tank at the same time. Why can't I just put them in my auto feeder together? Yeah, so the answer is it doesn't work because they're mm. different size pellets. And when you set your feeder, you're going to set it to emit a certain amount of food based on the size of the pellet. Mm. So unless they're the exact same size, which they never are, it's yeah. just going to feed almost all of one until it runs out of that one and then it will clog with the other one. So if you want to feed multiple types of food, you're going to be way, way, way better off with an auto feeder by getting two, one for each type of food that you want to feed because you're going to run into trouble trying to feed both of them from one. Number 16, love-hate relationship here because it can actually solve a lot of feeding problems in the tank mm -hmm. that can cause all kinds of other ones. Yeah, so don't make the mistake of polluting your tank with an auto feeder. So I mean, auto feeders are great, just like we said. You can put your foods in there, high energy fish, they get fed multiple times a day, especially since I'm not there. But in the same breath, they can overdo it and easily lead to nitrates, phosphates. It's just too easy to make the decision when you're setting it up. How many times a day you want to feed? Yep. Three. Uh, and then if I set it up to feed how much ever they look like they're eating, with really no insight into whether or not I'm overfeeding the mm. tank. So uh, I would lean to the small end of this with an auto feeder because you got a supply of food that's just dumping in there now automatically. Mm. You need to pay more attention because you're not doing it yourself and paying attention to it uh, visually. So this is my best advice to anybody who's going to consider an auto feeder, get a nitrate and phosphate test kit as well. It's not something you need to do all the time, but once a month, check whether or not this auto feeder is dumping in way too much food mm. for your filtration. Once a month, just figure out if you're polluting the tank with excess food from the auto feeder. Number 17, this is another fail that one size fits all answer is total garbage. Yeah, the mistake here is not thinking about the size of food for your fish's needs. Like we said earlier, it's a diverse population of different fish. Uh, they all have different sized mouths. They all have different sized feeding habits. So asking, you know, which is the best fish food out there doesn't really answer the question in its entirety because I don't know if the smaller pellet is right or the larger pellet is right, and my small fish won't eat my larger pellets. Yet, or worse yet, they will desperately try to. And even though their digestive system is not designed to take something down this big, uh, they will do out of desperation, yeah. right? And so if I have a food that's one size fits all, know that for at least half of the fish, I'm doing this poorly. Yeah. Uh, and so this is one of the things I actually like about the TDO Chroma Boost here. Not only is their approach to nutrition and the support from the breeding community mm -hmm. something I really like, I can immediately touch the like a foil line mylar bag, knowing they're protecting the contents of this product. But beyond that, it comes in all the different sizes that feed different fish. It's a recognition, recognition that like, the fish aren't all the same. Right. And so something like the, uh, the antheas, they're eating tiny, tiny, tiny little things out of the water. So we should feed them tiny, tiny, tiny little things. They're easy to digest rapidly. We shouldn't be giving them big foods that are desperately trying to mouth. And, and it, it, I just like this. This specific uh, one here is actually a kit. Yes. So they sell like a extra small, small and medium, but they go all the way up to large. So you can just kind of identify the size of your fish and then feed them correctly. They're only like uh, 10 bucks a piece, so you can kind of experiment with what you think is the best for your food. But consider the size of your food or your size of your fish, what they eat naturally, and what you should be feeding them in terms of size. Number 18, there isn't a right answer to this, but you should think about it in some fashion. 
Yeah, so don't make the mistake of not considering the sinking pattern or the right flow in your tank to give your fish the opportunity uh, to capture the, the food before it goes under a rock or before it goes over in the overflow. So a lot of pumps have like a feed mode that will turn them off mm -hmm. or just slow them down. You know, the Apex has an option. You can hit a feed mode and it will incorporate all kinds of different actions. Yeah. Even turn up, shut off your return pump so you don't have water going and all the food going over. But like... A lot of these foods uh, and the different fish uh, will do better in different environments. So something like a copper band, which is like a very timid fish, may do better when you're feeding with no flow. And then even just like sprinkling some over where the uh, more aggressive fish will go and then making sure you get them too. Right. Uh, so, you know, really thinking about it and you know, selecting the foods that you're using and then combine it with some flow to make sure that they're getting as much of it as possible and it isn't going down the overflow. And even some sinking foods, if you have fish that actively eat off the bottom, mm -hmm. pay attention to their behavior and give them the right tool for the right job. 19, don't think about just tomorrow. Think about many years to come. Yeah, so the mistake here is not thinking about your, when you choose a fish, you might be signing up for the fish's lifespan, which could be upwards of a decade or more, and the feeding, uh, particular feeding habits of that fish. So be sure that you're ready for that uh, type of fish and providing for it in that manner so that it has the chance to make it that decade or more. That's kind of that expert only stuff, yeah. right? So the best example I can think of is the uh, dwarf golden moray that we have. You have to actually spear the uh, like krill or the large mysis mm -hmm. or whatever food we're going to feed it. Go find him, entice him out, get him to come out and eat it, and then he'll chomp it down. But I have to be willing to do that. It's not just walking by, putting some pellets in, or right. throwing a cube. And I have to not be willing to do that for a year or two. I mean, this organism is going to live for a long time, uh, and he's relying on me to not have it starved to death, which is like the worst possible death. So why would I do that for uh, uh, an animal that I'm not willing to do that for a long time? So yeah. just think about what you're really willing to do and then commit to it because the animal's actually relying on you to do that. All right, so number 20, the foundation of bulk resupply actually, but actually my personal favorite project that I've ever done with my tanks and one of the most fulfilling things I think you could do. Yeah, so don't make the mistake of not considering DIY food or not making it yourself. One. It's fun, like I can go out and source all of these different seafoods, make it together, blend it together. I'm, I'm competently thinking about my fish. I'm thinking about you know, what they need. I can incorporate different size foods. I can, all of these considerations that we told you about in the last 19, I can do that by making my own DIY food. So we talked about DIY frozen reef chili. Yep. So you can take all of those things, and most of it's just stuff you're gonna get at the supermarket. Uh, you can go out and find those things, chop it up, and create a food that you're actually looking for. Some of it will be mixed up with the stuff you see in front of you, but take the information that you mm. use today, mix it together, and you can actually usually mix up like a whole year's worth in a single uh, effort. One batch. But often what will happen too is uh, reef clubs will get together and make a whole batch for everyone. Mm -hmm. It's a really great project for that type of thing. But it allows you to you know, engage with the animals that you care for on a totally different level. Think about the nutritional needs, incorporate it in there. So one of my favorite, favorite projects, and you can actually see that guy right here. So go check out Do It Yourself Reef Chili. You can see the recipe. It will be just for fish. You can do it for corals. Yes. And then like super mega tanks as well.